Right now, young women are really putting their foot down and saying, these are our bodies. So we don't really care what you, you know, 45-year-old mom in the suburbs, think is consent. And we don't care what you, 55-year-old college president, think is consent. These are our bodies and this is what we say. From the conviction of Vanderbilt University football players for raping an unconscious student to the he said, she said story behind Columbia University's Mattress Girl. I will be carrying this dorm room mattress with me everywhere I go for as long as I attend the same school as my rapist. To the discredited Rolling Stone account of a gang rape at the University of Virginia. Few topics generate more emotion and outrage than sexual assault on college campuses. Vanessa Gregoriadis is a National Magazine award-winning journalist and the author of the new book, Blurred Lines, Rethinking Sex, Power, and Consent on Campus. Millennial college students are actually having less sex than their baby boomer counterparts did, writes Gregoriadis, but today's encounters take place in a hyper-sexualized and pornified social media context that has rewritten the rules of consent and privacy. The result is confusion and recriminations from all sides when it comes to sex and assault on campuses. Are assault rates and rape culture out of control, or have we entered what left-wing Northwestern professor Laura Kipnis has called a new era of sexual McCarthyism? I talked to Gregoriadis about all this and more in Reason's New York studio. Vanessa, thanks for talking. Thank you for having me. Your book is not only richly reported, it's filled with interviews with dozens, uh, if not hundreds, of students, administrators, researchers. It's a deeply nuanced look at a subject that typically evokes really sharply polarized positions. But you write, it's tempting to chant, believe women, and simply leave it at that. But there's a mushy middle here or a blurry middle. Describe what you mean by that mushy middle or blurry middle. I went to 20 campuses, I talked to students themselves, tried to interact as a peer, not as an adult, coming asking weird, intrusive questions, right? I'm kind of a gonzo journalist out of the Rolling Stone mold. I put on a backpack. I look relatively young, not like a Gen X mother of two, which is what I actually am, and went to campus food courts, went to frat parties. You know, I took my babysitter's ID. She's 24 years old. So I would take that with me to campuses so I could show that to bouncers at like college bars mm -hmm. and at frat parties to get in so that, you know, the person wouldn't think that I was using like the worst fake idea in the world mm -hmm. of my actual age in the 1970s. So I spoke with these students and what I learned is, yes, of course, there is rape on campus. And I'm talking about physically violent rape where a woman's will is over ridden and also rape of you know women and and men who are passed out from drinking right almost like a necrophilia kind of thing i mean it's really repulsive but much more often what i was finding is people kids talking to me about cases that were blurry and they weren't blurry in terms of the way we might have once thought about sexual assault, where a woman just kind of protests and says, no, no, right. no. But the guy, you know, knows that she, this is just a faux Right. Thing, it, it, I mean, it's not right? the Hollywood fantasy of the 40s or even the 60s mm -hmm. of where no, no, no. And then, you know, the kiss and it dissolves into a marriage scene or something. Right. Exactly. I mean, I these mean, are genuinely cases of, I mean, I, apart from the, the clear cases of assault, there mm -hmm. are things there are where cases. everybody is unclear about exactly what transpired. Sure, these are cases about misconstrued consent, right? And nobody watching this, you and I probably do not have the same definition of consent. There is no nationwide definition. There's not even a cusp millennial definition. But right now, young women are really putting their foot down and saying, these are our bodies, mm -hmm. and we want a new definition, and we're driving this train. So we don't really care what you, you know, 45-year-old mom in the suburbs, think is consent. And we don't care what you, 55-year-old college president, think is consent. These are our bodies, and this is what we say is what fair. Is, what is driving that sense of, uh, of what you found, you know, a real sense of empowerment? You know, there's an assistance there. There's not always a radical coherence, mm -hmm. or a, but, you know, what is driving that mm -hmm. 
sense of, look, these are our bodies and we're going to do with them, you know, we control them, nobody else does. Sure. I mean, I think it's part of the radicalism that spread on campus, right, starting in, you know, a couple of years ago, but actually even a bit further back. And even further back than that, when Obama was elected, there was an immediate rise of these female pop stars like Beyonce and Rihanna and Katy Perry and Taylor Swift and all of these non-manufactured stars whose message is one message and it's girl power mm -hmm. and it's girls are in control and it's I may stand here in a bikini singing my song but I'm objectifying myself and I will always be in control sexually and professionally and in the home this is the time for girls to rule. And there's a whole edifice of female-centric media from Jezebel to Bustle to even Cosmo today that are purveyors of the most radical feminist thought that I have heard outside of 1977. And, but in that, it's also, it contravenes a lot of uh, tr more traditional feminism in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, it's, uh, it's highly sexualized in a lot of ways that at various points going back to, you know, whether it's Simone de Beauvoir or, uh, you know, uh, Gloria Steinem mm -hmm. uh, or Betty Friedan. I mean, this is a highly sexualized, highly public mm -hmm. um, perspective that even a lot of older feminists are uncomfortable with. But is that right. one of the sources of, of um, confusion? Mm -hmm. Because men, you know, men or boys see that one, I mean, even some women see it one way, even men and boys see it another way. So what, what has happened concurrently with millennial boys? Mm -hmm. Because they're, they're growing up in the same world. They're growing up in a world of kind of um, public privacy almost, or mm -hmm. where the body is much more displayed in all forms. Why aren't they getting the message that mm -hmm. the girls are sending? Well, look, this is a very confusing moment, okay? We have kids today who are just like, they're searching for likes. That's all they're doing all day. They're putting pictures up. I mean, it's completely visually based culture now, right? It's Instagram and Snapchat all the time. And those pictures, they want attention for them. And the best way to get attention if you're a girl is to put up a provocative photo. If you show some flesh, you're going to get a lot of likes. If you're a college freshman girl, you know that, right? This is happening at the same time when a, almost a pornified look is what we see among our reality stars. It's what we see. TV anchors who are female outside of Candy Crowley can't even be on TV unless they're in a tank top, right? So, I mean, there's no question that the standard for the sexualization of the female in the public eye, you know, and everybody's in the public eye now, right, ha it has just risen astronomically. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to say sit here and say that boys who are growing up in a time, an American culture that has taught them that girls who look slutty may also be slutty, right? Mm -hmm. That when girls look a certain way, it means that they may be offering something sexually, are not going to be confused by this intensely sexualized and sex positive moment. Because these girls, in addition to sexualizing themselves, are trying to also foster within themselves a, th uh, a female sexual empowerment, mm -hmm. a feeling that this is my body, boys stay away until I tell you what you can do. Obviously the book is partly about both women talking about that and they're confused by it mm -hmm. as well as as, as well as boys or, or men on campus. You know, your book begins and ends with a discussion of what's probably the most publicized story of the past several years about sex and assault on campus, uh, the 2013 case involving Columbia students Emma Sulkowitz and Paul Nungesser. Sulkowitz accused uh, Nungesser of rape during an encounter that they both agree began as consensual. He was cleared of wrongdoing by a campus uh, hearing. Mm -hmm. Um, she protested uh, that by carrying a mattress as part of an art project around for her entire senior year, including the graduation. Just a few weeks ago, Nungesser received a confidential settlement from Columbia University, which he brought under Title IX, the, you know, the gender equity statement saying that they had failed to provide a welcoming environment for him. They mm -hmm. subjected him to harassment based on gender terms. Why is that case emblematic of you know, mm -hmm. of, of the blurred lines mm -hmm. in your title. Okay, well, you know, 
First of all, what happened between Emma and Paul, what she alleges is that they had had oral sex, they had had vaginal sex, and it escalated to anal sex, mm -hmm. which you know they had perhaps had before, right. and at that point it became rape. Now, not everybody in America agrees that once you're in the bed and you've done some intercourse, that anything else that happens there is not fair game, right? I mean. I don't agree with that, but the fact is is that many Americans right. would feel that way. So that was the first thing that was complicated about her story. The second thing is is that on an evidence tip, you know, like many of these cases, there's really no evidence to be had here. You know, mm -hmm. we don't have the, you know, the the photos that demonstrate exactly what he did. You know, we don't really no in the end. And what you think about that case probably has a lot to do with your own feeling about what should constitute sexual assault. What is a fair standard of evidence, right? If we know she doesn't have much, then what did Columbia really do wrong? Well, I mean, one thing that Nungesser uh, alleged was that at the uh, initial hearings, he was not allowed to provide evidence, uh, exculpatory evidence, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, emails, text messages, Facebook messages, things like that. And I, and you know, right. what what I'm getting at is, you know, there's her side, um, and that raises, you know, both in terms of her narrative, which he either challenges or not. But then, is the, you know, is it also a is it a case not simply about sexual assault, but also about due process, mm -hmm. um, and and whether or not these things should be adjudicated on campus, or mm -hmm. you know, and nobody would say if there was a murder on campus that you would say, okay, well we'll have you know we'll we'll get a bunch of faculty members, a student representative, and you know an administrator to to try that case. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, there are multiple ways in which this is kind of a blurry issue. Right. Well, okay. You know, when Emma got attacked for not taking her case to the cops, mm -hmm. which a lot of New York media said, well, why didn't you do that? She went to the cops. Right. She did file a police take report. Her case, right? right. So, why are we so sure that the police, who have historically mm -hmm. had a terrible record with rape, and let's remember, we are talking about date rape here for the mm -hmm. most part, right? We are not talking about blood and bruises and physical evidence. The vagina is built to have a baby come out of it. There has to be a hell of a lot of force right. going on, right? And even when there is a hell of a lot of force, there's not always physical evidence. That's why the cops don't want anything to do with this. The prosecutors know that some weird college case that's about consent is one real hot political potato and they, they don't want hot potato, they don't want anything to do with that. So to me, this is, is really, you know, just a red herring in this whole conversation okay. because we know they're not going to take care of it, at least in the short term, maybe down the no. line, the police will get better, et cetera. But right now what we're talking about is new sexual standards, mm -hmm. new standards of sexual ethics, and the universities can be involved. Secondly, the case with Emma and Paul took place at Columbia, I want to say that was 2013. That was four years ago. There has been a vast change mm -hmm. on campuses with the amount of money that they've put into these kinds of departments, the training that they've given to their officers. Columbia now supplies attorneys on both sides, mm -hmm. okay? DeVos said all of this mumble jumbo about how these cases, nobody even knows what the charges are against them and blah, 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 blah. I, I don't think that's the mm. case, not at our prestigious universities anymore. I mean, universities would have to have a death wish to not be upholding due process in campus sexual assault cases at this point. At this they point, know yeah. the press is coming after them. They know they're going to get litigated. Is they that, know they're getting an OCR is, investigation. Is that a bad, and that's Office of Civil Rights, is that a bad outcome uh, in terms of process? Because it does seem, I mean, there are many cases that get reported, you know, where Due process is pretty sloppy, including mm -hmm. people like Laura Kipnis, who's you know, a professor at Northwestern, who had a case where a hostile workplace uh, case under Title IX was brought against her because of an article she had written in the Chronicle of Higher Education by grad students. She, in her book, uh, a recent book, she, you know, she was not allowed to have any kind of representation. So, mm -hmm. I, and I agree, it's it's a moving, you know, it's 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 shifting constantly, but. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems you're kind of skeptical about due process claims. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I'm not skeptical that due process has not been abrogated in some of these cases, but what I think people should understand is universities are getting better all the time mm -hmm. at handling these cases. They also need to understand that universities are bound by the federal privacy regulations that do not allow them to, to comment on any individual case. Thereby, when you read something about there being an investigation, right, from OCR, or what we see much more often now are the complaints from the accused boys being posted by their lawyers, being posted on document cloud. That is just the accused boy's story. I didn't hear the girl's part. It didn't get that far in the court yet, right? And the article that says OCR is investigating, you know, Wesleyan University or whatever, that one never has the comeback from the university. The university will never be able to speak on what they actually think happened with Emma and Paul. They'll never speak on what happened, you know, in any well, of these Well, we do cases. know, though, that, I mean, they found him innocent of the charges. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there is that, which right. seems well, to be not a I mean, my point to that thing. would also yeah. be, like, so he got a settlement. What was that yeah. settlement? They already found him right. innocent. So, you know, that just seems to well, me to be more media manipulation of the story, hmm. you know? Yeah. I'm not saying that what happened at Columbia in 2013 with Emma and Paul's case was good, mm -hmm. because I don't think it was. OK, I think Columbia was acting very sloppily back then, but I think they've changed. Okay. And I think a lot of universities have changed and they're not getting their due here. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah, I guess the press is always lagging in, in that sense or people mm -hmm. pick up on stories. Well, let's talk a little bit about the reality of sex on campus. First, in terms of actual activity or sexual activity and then in terms of assault, because one of the things your book, which is, is fascinating and is, is in, I don't want to say even handed because mm -hmm. that seems like, you know, it's, you know, on the one hand, on the other, but it's, you know, you, you look at what's going on, what is sexual activity, and this is something every older generation or the minute that you graduate from college, you assume that the freshmen are having tons more sex and better sex right. and more weird <laughs> sex and all yes. of that. But also then as you get older, you're like, oh my God, the, you know, the, it's, it's beyond Animal mm -hmm. House. It's mm -hmm. like Animal House and Thunderdome. What's going on, you know, in terms of rates of sex among mm -hmm. today's college students, mm -hmm. as well as uh, rates of assault? Okay, so rates of sex and rates of sexual assault don't seem to really be up, right? The average student has eight hookups over the course mm -hmm. of college, and that can be any sort of sexual activity. So that's like is, from a makeout session to... Right, to, to intercourse, so, yeah. exactly. Right. So, you know, 20% of college students graduate as virgins. Right. So there's certainly not as much And it's interesting sex. because only 8% showed up at college as virgins, so that's very <laughs> perplexing. Right, exactly. So, you know, the fact is that what's really going on is early sexual experiences and these are early sexual yep. experiences right the average age I think is 17 of losing your virginity in the and this is something that so, has ra radically changed from the uh, baby boom through now uh, you know higher rates of people graduate uh, high school without having sexual mm -hmm. experience etc so sure and we know yeah. that the more the kids are on their phones the less right. actual in yeah. real life sex the new curse uh, curse uh, <laughs> Alexander Graham Bell yeah uh, I mean Steve this Jobs. relationship with the hand is now the central relationship in college uh, you know back but... in my day <laughs> yeah, the relationship with the hand was also central but right. there was no phone in it <laughs> we're sadly back. we're going yeah. full circle you know the issue is is that these early sexual yeah. experiences are including assault and that's mm -hmm. what we need to talk about right. Out, right? Mm -hmm. We need to understand that there are guys who are, you know, pr I'm particularly, Predators. you know, going to talk about guys are pushing both men and women into sex that those, you know, those people do not want to have. And whether they're holding a hand behind that victim's back or they're taking advantage of a student who's barely speaking English. Um, and you by know, that you mean because they're drunk. Because they're yeah. drunk. They're yeah. so drunk, you know, and that's just... That's not cool. That's right. where I think the change is mm -hmm. coming, is that right. students are saying, look, that girl, she was wearing beer goggles. You took her home. You're not getting a high five in the morning. Right. And other girls are going to call that guy creepy. They may even call him a rapist, mm -hmm. right? And they're going to spread that all over campus and make sure that that guy has a bad name. And now other guys are watching what happened to that first mm -hmm. guy, and damn straight, they don't want that to happen to them. Mm -hmm. You know, and that is truly happening on campus. Now, how do you kind of moderate the or, or 
kind of go from the definitions of what one person's creepy mm-hmm. is another person's, you know, uh, completely anodyne compliment or mm-hmm, something like mm-hmm. that. I mean, well, sure. Yeah. Like, you know, out on the street, if some guy says, hey, baby, to me, I may say, screw you, get away from me. Right. And somebody else may say, thank you. You know, that mm-hmm. made my day. Uh, you know, low level acts of, of, you know, that's not even really harassment, right? No. That's like a cost street compliment, whatever, you know, but uh, it's not like a hiss is so great or somebody mm-hmm. yelling bitch at you on the street is so great. And those kinds of low level acts that happen at college all the time, like somebody squeezing a girl's ass in a frat house or, you know, just feeling up a girl on the couch who you happen to be sitting next to in the common room because she's wearing a parka and you know you could slip your hand under there and she's probably not going to say or do something like I would call that stuff creepy, yeah. right? And oh, I would call guys out for it, but yeah. young girls are calling that sexual assault. You know, one of the, the great virtues of the book is the number of students you talk to, particularly mm-hmm. uh, women on campus. And and that incident you're talking about with a woman who was wearing a parka and, mm-hmm. a, and a guy essentially assaulted her, he groped her vagina. Mm-hmm. What is going through the, the mind of a woman you know, where she's not going to get up or she's mm-hmm. not going to say something, especially because this is where I think for a lot of men it gets confusing of saying, well, you know, clearly I think most men would say that's fucked up. Uh, right. Like that is totally, you know, that is that is just not allowable. Um, and so then if a woman, and I realize this puts the onus on women, but if she doesn't respond in that way, then, mm-hmm. you know, what, I mm-hmm. mean, and in conversations with with girls on campus, and in many cases, they're girls. I mean, they're teenagers, they're young, they're inexperienced. What are they thinking? Well, first I would say also, in this country, we tend not to say no and try Mm -hmm. to confront people, right? So a guy, if the situation is reversed, you know, he may be into it. If he's not into it, he may not say much either, right? Or he may say, I have a girlfriend. He may not stand up and say no, right? right? In that case, there were other people present in the room. So she was embarrassed because she didn't know how to get out Mm -hmm. of the situation without embarrassing herself. Let's remember that a lot of women, despite everything I've said, carry a lot of shame around sex, Mm -hmm. right? So they have a problem expressing themselves sexually. This is just yep. simply a fact, you know. Women are socialized also to be polite, particularly in a sexual situation. So she then has a bunch of different things working against her saying something. I mean, one woman that I interviewed at Syracuse University talked to me about why she was very open about how she was promiscuous. She had had a lot of sex with different people. She didn't feel that she had been raped, but she felt she had been really pressured by a bunch of different guys who had maybe like pushed her head down. To to give a blowjob mm-hmm. or just kind of kind of pushed her into sex where she just really kind of wanted to go to sleep. And what she said is really why we need a yes means yes standard. She said, it's not that I didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't really want to say no. I wasn't totally opposed, but I was really, really drunk and I didn't want to have sex, but I wanted him to be satisfied and happy. And he said he had blue balls and I felt bad about it. But I never would have said yes Hmm. if he had said to me, are you sure you want to do this? I never would have said yes. When it comes to um, statistics, available statistics about on-campus assault rates, these are always heavily, uh, you know, debated and argued Mm -hmm. in in the media as well as even among, uh, you know, among the people who actually collect them. And that's also you have a great discussion of the, the wide variety of people all of whom are interested, you know, it, it isn't like there are any pro rapists mm-hmm. in the demography world who are like, let's right. do this. But <laughs> you find sure. yeah. <laughs> you, you, you find, you know, numbers or you produce numbers about unwanted sexual activity that range from about 20 percent. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that one in five student, right. uh, students by the time they graduate college will have had some kind of unwelcome sexual uh, uh, advance or event to maybe 7 percent where the definition is much more um, kind of specific and explicit mm-hmm, about mm-hmm. sexual penetration mm-hmm, or other acts mm-hmm. of violence against the body. What is, you know, what, what is your best estimate or how, how do we talk about that? Because the one in five, sometimes one in four number gets bandied about and it mm-hmm. seems that that may kind of confuse as much as it clarifies. Right, well, I mean, there's nobody who works in the field of demography who mm-hmm. thinks that this is not, is not a total mess. Right. This is a huge mess. We don't have a good grasp of how many college students are sexually assaulted. We only know, by the way, 
what's happening at a specific school, and then we're mm -hmm. extrapolating, oh, that's a nationwide number. And a so, number of the studies, I mean, early on that produced like pretty, pretty large numbers, right. they were, uh, you talk about this, I mean, a couple were just at two schools, mm -hmm. uh, people like David Lisak, who created the serial predator model, it's right. very influential, it, it's all based on very non-representative sure. cases. Yes. Yes, but I mean, there's also a question of should attempted assaults mm -hmm. be included? Just because a girl went home with a guy and she felt he was creepy and weird and threw him out, right. she's not sure that she was mm -hmm. almost assaulted there, right? So I think that probably shouldn't be included. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, there's not a lot of, of, of uh, nuance there about something like a groping versus a violent penetrative rape where somebody locks a door from the inside after you've done a bunch of lines of cocaine with that guy, mm -hmm. okay? So those things need to be separated out. I don't believe that we should separate out, you know, uh, penetration from non-penetration, but I do think we need to separate out violence mm -hmm. from non-violence, right? Um, some guy coming up behind you in a on a dance floor and grinding on you is not necessarily an act of violence, right? And I think putting all of these things in some big pot and stirring it around the way a lot of activists have is just really, you know, created one of the most intense backlashes of misogyny that I have seen in my lifetime. So we need to be very clear about our definitions. Let's talk about the role of the media and kind of hyping and distorting you know, this discussion. I mean, and it is mm -hmm. a society-wide discussion that every generation has, but uh, particularly about sex and assault on campus. In many of the highest profile cases, going back a few years to the Duke lacrosse team, mm -hmm. which was charged with gang raping, and that fell apart. Um, and there was an outcry by the faculty of Duke to say even before any kind of legal investigation had been launched, you know, we got to get rid of these people. They, they shut down the lacrosse program, et cetera. It turned out that the, the reality was very, very different than that. There was Rolling Stone's story about a gang rape at University of Virginia. I mean, essentially ended, you know, with a complete retraction mm -hmm. of that story and the, the events of that. Um, you know, those are completely discredited. Other cl less clear-cut ones are one of the main stories in The Hunting Ground, a documentary mm -hmm. about sexual assault on campus, uh, involved a black male law student at Harvard who was accused of sexual misconduct. Uh, something like 19 law professors said that The Hunting Ground misrepresented mm -hmm. the case and the facts of the case in a, in a pernicious way. Um, the Solkowitz Nungesser case is more of a kind of mirror by which we can see what we feel rather than knowing what's going on. Talk about the media's role. Like, obviously, the media loves to talk about this stuff because it's young kids, it's sex, it's booze. Sure. It is, you know, violence. I mean, yeah. you know, our, I mean, you, you, uh, you know, great classic literature is all about, you know, sex, murder, assault, violence. Um, Absolutely. Is the great the media <laughs> yeah. in the discussion mm -hmm. of this topic? Yeah, I mean, the media has been, you know, the the worst actor in all of this, right? Because they're only interested in cases that are unbelievable. They're interested in Duke lacrosse, a bunch of Duke lacrosse players at this fantastic university raped two prostitutes, right? right? Black, or white a, guys a black raping prostitute prostitutes. was raped yeah. by these white, overprivileged right. Southern males, or UVA story wasn't that different, right? A helpless, defenseless young girl went on a date to this fraternity and in a pledge ritual, seven boys pushed her down on a glass table which shattered beneath her and they raped her. One of them had a beer bottle. Guy from her anthropology seminar was there. Okay, these are unbelievable stories because they're unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Because that's not what's really happening. Mm -hmm. There is not gang rape going on as a pledge ritual at UVA upstairs while a party is going downstairs. I'm not saying that never in the history of, you know, fraternities in America, there hasn't been a pledge ritual that has involved a rape, but these are certainly not the kinds of things that are going on on campus. What's going on on campus are questions about consent, but that becomes mm -hmm. an abstract story and the media doesn't know how to deal with that. They mm -hmm. just want their, it bleeds, it leads, it's mm -hmm. five o'clock local news and we're talking about girls, you need to be scared because there's scary, scary, scary predators coming after you right. on campus while you walk to the library. Is that, you know? And is that, you know, in, in a sense, reading your book, what, what is both 
you know, fascinating to me about it is that it's about this larger question of sexual mores and which do change. And, you know, just as, you know, we grew up in a, a totally different sexual world than our parents, or, mm -hmm. or we like to think that anyway, our children grow up in a totally mm -hmm. different world. So it's about that larger conversation. But then how do, how can the media represent, you know, mm -hmm. they don't like to because they want to talk about cases that are clear cut or that stir deep mm -hmm. primordial, uh, you know, fears and anxieties and titillation. Mm -hmm. You know, how, what, what is a way of representing that conversation mm -hmm. about consent? Well, I think like Stanford and Columbia, both of whom were hit real hard mm -hmm. on this sexual assault issue from a right. PR's perspective, have both been promoting this idea of healthy sexuality. Let's talk about sexual more. Let's talk about ethics. Let's begin to bring this to a conversation that everybody can contribute to. So let's get away from who's lying and who's telling the truth. Let's get away from the unbelievable story of rape. And then, of course, in America, we love to debunk that story. We love to say women lie. That or, was wrong. Or we right? love, I mean, uh, you know, this is another thing that's fascinating in the book. And you talk a little bit about intersectionality mm -hmm. uh, and the way that it's infusing feminism, campus feminism. There is a really kind of ugly, usually unspoken, uh, unremarked upon uh, race issue here. Mm -hmm. So the Vanderbilt story, uh, where uh, I guess it was three or four Vanderbilt uh, football players, mm -hmm. uh, black, uh, were found guilty of raping a woman uh, who, was, who had passed out and they took pictures, but it's blacks on white. Mm -hmm. that, that also, uh, particularly a school like Vanderbilt, which is, you know, in Nashville, it's part of the South. Mm -hmm. um, how does that play out in this, mm -hmm. the, the racial issues or racial dynamics? Well, you know, uh, there, you know, certainly are uh, attorneys and, you know, the Atlantic Magazine has recently published a story about this who um, anecdotally think that there are more black kids, uh, uh, black boys who are being accused of assault on campus, particularly by white women. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, Jeannie Sook has had this idea of like, well, maybe they, the white woman wakes up the next day and says, well, did I just sleep with a black man? Well, that wouldn't be uh, part of what how I see myself as a sexual being. I feel that something went wrong there. You know, I'm not sure I would really yeah. go that far. I will say that in football, the gang rape that is happening there is largely happening with black players. Players. And it is largely, you know, football players are celebrities yeah. on campus. They have groupies. They have mm -hmm. girls who want to have sex with them. And the real problem is that they will have sex with one girl. Maybe the girl will have sex with a football player and a recruit, right? Because they got to mm -hmm. get the recruit laid right. when he comes to college because otherwise he's not going to come there to play for them. Which and is, then, by the way, I mean, let's not sick. gloss over it's, that. that. It's sick. Yeah, it's and, sick and it's happening Everywhere. And Rick Pitino, the you know right. uh, you know legendary coach, uh, just got fired. Basketball mm -hmm. coach just got fired from uh, University of Louisville for mm -hmm. you know his role in in allowing that type of behavior mm -hmm. to happen. Sure, I mean that is essentially kind of the, the uh, origin of the Vanderbilt rape case. That's what happened mm -hmm. with the Golden Gophers in the University of Minnesota. Right. Um, that big case last year. Over and over, we see these cases where there are girls who want to have sex with one football player, but they don't want to have sex with the other ones. You know, James. Mm -hmm. Winston case. I don't know what really happened there, mm -hmm. but you know, that could be a similar case. Remember, there was something going on with a girl in Jameis Winston and his friends were able to open the door and come in with cell phone cameras. Right. What happened? What was she thinking right then and there? You know, so these girls then are faced with these, you know, like really pretty menacing figures, right? Mm -hmm. Um and, you know, that, the, that's something we really need to deal with. That is a reality. In the book, you talk a lot about sports, uh, you know, and it's football players, basketball players in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, they, I mean, it's not just in college that they're celebrities. They're accorded a kind of privilege that right. very few people do, and they don't. They, you know, one, and this may be stereotyping, but mm -hmm. they live in a world where nobody says no to them. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or if they say no, they don't hear no. Also, fraternities mm -hmm. are, you know, the site of a lot of this activity mm -hmm. or of the most, um, you know, provocative and probably emblematic cases. Um, you know, is, you know, are these things that need to be 
Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, the fraternities obviously should not be on campus. Like, mm -hmm. I have no idea why there's a Title IX exemption for single sex social groups. I mean, that makes mm -hmm. like it, it just well, it's makes absolutely no sense. because they're not no really sense. on campus, right? They're they're well, some so of them are on agree, campus, yeah. and some of them are off campus. And you know, the universities are doing this big dance with the fraternities mm -hmm. and the legal liability, right? But what's going on is universities don't want the legal liability from drinking from their mm -hmm. students. They pushed the drinking completely off campus. You get caught with a keg in your dorm, yeah. you are in some serious yeah. trouble today, right. right? We, in the 90s, had no, you know, we kind of did it. Maybe somebody hey, got in trouble once along I like, got to tell you, in yeah. the 80s, you could actually <laughs> legally have those Right, campus. of course. So it's, yeah. it, it changes. So, yeah. I mean, they, you know, my problem with the frats is not, obviously, all frats are bad, but, um, you know, we know what's going on here is about these kind of gender norms, and gender norms are reinforced by frats, obviously, because, you know, one is, there's no women in there. Um, it, it just seems to me like all of this discussion of due process for these tiny, tiny number of cases that happen across the country was something like 6,000 cases in 2014. Mm -hmm. 6,000 campus tribunals across the entire country for sexual assault. And yet we're not talking about the fact that the Greek system is up by half over the last decade, that there's mm -hmm. more binge drinking going on. Binge drinking is directly connected to well, sexual assault. Yeah, let's talk about, on, on both sides, mm -hmm. right? Because on both if, sides. If a, and and it's, sides, not, yeah. it's not to impute responsibility to a woman, but mm -hmm. uh, I mean, and well, let's talk about that in the context of your recommendations for how to, you know, how to reduce sexual assault mm -hmm. and also how to have a healthier conversation about sexual mores mm -hmm. on campus. One of the main things that you say is uh, lower the drinking age to 18. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how does that address address this issue? Well, the issue is, is that you have young people coming to college. All, a lot of these sexual assaults are happening right during September, right? Right when the kids get there. And they don't have a lot of and experience And particularly with among, uh, among freshmen. freshmen. Yeah. yeah. I mean, something like 88% of gang rape victims, according to a, one insurer, are freshmen right? So they're coming there. They don't have a lot of experience with drinking. They're getting blasted out of their minds. They may be in a blackout and they're agreeing to sexual activity that they wouldn't normally. Mm -hmm. Now you might say, well, that's, that's your individual responsibility to deal with that. And a, an activist may say, well, according to the patriarchy, the girl who gets really drunk will think she needs to service a guy if she gets into a sexual experience with him. I'm not saying either of those things. Although right? you, you would agree, I mean, Emily Yaffe, a writer uh, at that mm -hmm. point at Slate, um, she, when she, uh, in an article said, you know, you know, women, if you want to, if you want to avoid really horrible situations, mm -hmm. it's a good idea not to get shit faced. Right. She was called a rape denialist mm -hmm. by people at, you know, websites like Jesuit. Isabel right. and Bustle. Mm -hmm. I mean, clearly that's fucked up, mm -hmm. right? I mean, uh, to say, I agree. yeah. Yes, no, I, I agree. I mean, I, I, not, I don't agree with yeah. a lot of what Emily Yaffe is saying, but right. I do agree with her there that, you know, alcohol is a problem here, that young women, binge drinking is, is up right. for women, has been for a while. And what the issue is, is that like, you can drink in moderation, girls, that is no problem, but there's research showing that over nine drinks, you are at a higher risk for sexual assault. Now, over nine drinks is an obscene amount of alcohol for a 19 year old girl, mm -hmm. right? So there's nothing about being in a blackout or passing out at a house, an off-campus house, even maybe even in your dorm with a bunch of guys that you don't know that is safe. Right. There's nothing about that that's right. safe. But it's also then what what is is the, do you think the attitudes are changing that, you know, if you're one of the guys in that house mm -hmm. and there's an unconscious body oh, absolutely. Um, is it changing that I mean, I obviously this happens. I struggle to understand mm -hmm. it where any would be like anyone would be like that's an invitation even to take a, a horrifying photo, much less actually sure. acting on that. Right, is, right, right. Is there reason to believe that boys are you know, mm -hmm. getting better at mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I mean, we don't have any hard data on if the assaults are going down, and mm -hmm. everything's being muddied by this broadening definition right. of assault. So now you have girls counting themselves as victims that maybe wouldn't have five years ago. I mean, as I said before, it is a total mm -hmm. mess. So we're not going to get hard data on that. But in my conversations with guys, anecdotally, there is no question that to be a cool guy, and I'm talking about Brown University, and I'm talking about mm -hmm. cool campuses, I mean, like the University of Michigan, corners of that campus, places like that, that to be a cool guy and a guy that girls want to date, mm -hmm. you must at least give lip service 
to these ideas. Mm -hmm. You must at least in your words, be pro-survivor. And if you're going to do something like mess with a drunk girl, you better make sure that there other, aren't other guys there mm -hmm. who are going to go around the next day mm -hmm. and tell girls that you did that because the girls will ostracize you. Now, you also, in one of your uh, recommendations at, uh, towards the end of the book, you do say for people who are accused, mm -hmm. uh, call a lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, oh, absolutely. Yeah, and yeah. Why, why is that? Yeah, I mean, look, being accused of sexual assault at college is, you know, the, pretty much the worst thing that can happen to you at college, right? You pull the unlucky story. You pull the short straw. It happened to you, you know. This, there, there's no good outcome. Right? right? Like either you're going to go through a horrible tribunal and you're going to come out relatively unscathed, but everybody on campus right. is going to think you're a rapist or you're going to get kicked out of school and you're going to be humiliated in front of your family and you may not be able to get into a school of comparable value, blah, 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 blah. I mean, you know, it's kind of like a divorce. There's yeah. only losers here. Right. Right. So you must call a lawyer. You must call your parents right away. I cannot tell you how many boys I talked to who didn't call their parents because mm -hmm. they were embarrassed. They thought, I'm an adult. I can handle this. Oh, the school, the school that I, I wanted so badly to get into this school. I love this school. I have a bumper sticker of the school. They never do anything to hurt me, right? No, no, no. That is not the case. You are in a serious situation. Going yeah. back to the Title IX guidance in the Office of Civil Rights, the Dear Colleague letter, what that reduced the standard of um, of evidence in, in campus tribunals or, mm -hmm. or you know uh, administrative hearings, and and you've talked about how they've changed, but it went from uh, using a traditional clear and convincing standard, which mm -hmm. was a higher burden of proof that mm -hmm. something bad happened, to uh, what was called a preponderance of evidence standard that holds that it's more likely than not that sexual harassment occurred. And in your book, you talk about how that's kind of like it's 50-50 and then the feather gets put mm -hmm. on the guilty right. side. Is it a good thing to get rid of that? Because mm -hmm. that does seem odd, right. in, you know, particularly in, in, a, in a kind of hearing that is, you know, mimics legal, uh, legal due process. Right. But, uh, and, you know, is that, where does that fit in? Because mm -hmm. you're actually in favor of the lower level. Right. Um, how, do you, how do you justify that? Okay, well, first of all, you know, like 80% of campuses were already using the preponderance of mm -hmm. the evidence before Obama got involved here. Okay. So it is a bit of a myth that, mm -hmm. you know, clear and convincing was true all over the place. You know, the fact is that, as I said before, sexual assault is incredibly hard to prove. Coming up with that 1% to push it to 51% is a lot harder than you think, mm -hmm. right? And if we raise the burden of proof, what I believe will happen is you will have a lot of middle-aged administrators that are already carrying their own biases that will say, wait a second, so this girl sexted a picture to this guy five hours before this alleged assault, right? She, she sent him a picture of her boobs? Well, I mean, why do we even care what happened after that? Mm -hmm. The next day, very often, girls will text the guy the next day and say, listen, you know, I had a good time last night, but some stuff happened that I feel weird about. Can you, can you give me a call? Could we meet up? Oh, yeah, you know, emoji, heart, heart, heart. I mean, these are, these are young girls, mm -hmm. you know? They're trying to get the guy to talk to them, to try to understand what happened last night. I, I, feel, I feel violated by that. Can we talk about this, right? I mean, under a clear and convincing standard, are those boys gonna be punished? I just am finding that very hard to believe. So just from a pragmatic point of view. But what if that means though, if, I mean, it's one, th you know, and it's one thing to say, after something, something I'm, I'm not comfortable with something, mm -hmm. let's talk about that, as opposed to oftentimes the text messages, you know, and this is even in the Sulkowitz mm -hmm. case, where there were, you know, there was communications after the alleged assault, you know, where it was not, she wasn't saying, hey, something weird happened. No, she, she did say, hey, well, something in weird some, has happened. Yeah. She did say that in some. Look, I'm yeah. not going to say that the text messages yeah. between the two of them yeah. aren't damning, because well, they I, are, I, yeah, no, but no, no, what she I'm, did say, yeah. I want to talk to you, and remember, yeah. They, I'm not sure they ever got together to talk about it. Right. They both knew that something happened yeah. that night. He wasn't totally blindsided. Yeah. He knew something had happened. I, she didn't like it. I guess it. in you terms know? of the preponderance of evidence, so what, you know, what if, you know, 50, I mean, it's got 51% isn't the right, 
you know, a uh, marker of guilt mm -hmm. or, uh, or that something happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. we're going to see because yeah. certainly universities are going to go back mm -hmm. to clear and convincing. Yeah. Um, someplace like Harvard is. Uh, All of the religious institutions yeah. are going to do this. And Well, you know, and this raises a, a related question, which is in, in talking with Camille Polly about this, she said, you know, you know, and she obviously she's, you know, a, a baby boomer, right. sexual empowerment feminist. I mean, when you talk, you know, when you talk about people like Madonna or Katy Perry mm -hmm. or Kesha or whatnot, they're all kind of they're standing in the shadow, you know, sure. that Camille yeah. Polly has thrown on certain levels. She says one of the biggest problems, and this fits in a way with your book. You know, part of the problem here is why are colleges, you know, doing things about students? Like, why do they have dorms? Why are they in the the mm -hmm. personal lives of students? Uh, and one of the things, one of the themes in your book is that most of this stuff, you know, we call it campus rape, mm -hmm. but virtually none of it actually happens on the campus. It's almost always right. off campus, mm -hmm. partly because you have to drink off campus. Mm -hmm. uh, so people live off campus mm -hmm. so they can drink. You go to parties right. off campus. How does that play into, mm -hmm. you know, this larger conversation? I mean, the conversation we need to have and that, that you know, parents and students and people are starting to have is yeah. what the hell is college for anyway, right? right? Like here we are, all of these kids on a campus for four years, no responsibility really, no genuine academic interests, a hell of a lot of leisure time, <laughs> a lot of time to be on yeah. your phone, hang out with your pals, hang yeah. out with your girls. You know, is this an etiquette factory? <laughs> uh, is it a career making factory? Yeah, it's a finishing school it's or a, a holding school, tank. Right, yeah. it's a holding yeah. tank. And now that adulthood has like continues to 30, mm -hmm. like, you know, do we really need this four-year period where parents are going broke trying to send their kids to do what exactly? Right. So I think that anybody involved in universities today knows that we're in a bubble, it's going to pop. Yeah. And, you know, my children may not be going to anything that resembles a Vanderbilt University, mm -hmm. right? Well, and, you know, that's uh, to uh, drive home the the point of your book, which is that this conversation is happening mm -hmm. uh, and that, you know, you, we, we can have a better, a more open or a less open, a more conscious or less mm -hmm. conscious uh, conversation. I mean, part of it is to have a conversation mm -hmm. with if you're going away to college to actually talk with your parents. You stress in one of your recommendations is don't hurry over the actual sexual consent policy in everybody's student handbook. Mm -hmm. uh, what what will we find mm -hmm. if we actually read yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, look, New York, Connecticut, California, Illinois, all of these states have for all public and private colleges a yes means yes standard. So no means no is not enough. Silence is not consent. You must get some sort of, you know, feedback from the partner. Now, for Gen Xers and even maybe boomers, the question was like, should I get a condom? Right. And that was really a question about protection and permission. It was mm -hmm. a question where, you know, the guy would usually ask it and the girl or the guy could say no, because we're not having sex, actually. You know, now, you know, there's protection being used sometimes, but also there seems to be need, a, a need to be this additional question mm -hmm. of are we ready? Which is a question that high schoolers ask their first girlfriends or boyfriends. Mm -hmm. Right. Are we ready to do this? But yet two years later, it's all cool and not a word needs to be uttered in the bedroom, right? I think the parents will find that they don't even need to have a conversation about sex with their college student. All they need to do is flip <coughs> through their college handbook. You know, the Ivy Leagues have this. Mm -hmm. Many state universities have this. And just say, wow, this is a yes means yes standard. This says, like, mm -hmm. it's it's sexual misconduct. And it's clear uh, that that's not going, because people aren't recording this, although, I mean, you, you mentioned in passing that there are apps and things mm -hmm. like that. Now, right. this gets to a kind of almost like Kurt Vonnegut level level satire of right. like, okay, and at this <laughs> yes. point, and you know, and then or maybe you can punish people if the orgasm isn't good enough, right, right, right. et cetera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, so it, it's not going to clear up the confusion or, or it's not going to completely de-blur the lines, but it, it will pro I mean, your argument is that it will provide a better context, right. a social right. context. I mean, the people who, who understand why uh, sexual assault happens best, you know, the people who teach this, the older women who have really studied this from a social psychological perspective, really want girls to know that what they need to do is remove themselves from the situation first. Don't go home with the random guy after the frat party who's like, hey, we should go back to my apartment because I got some beer there. Just come mm -hmm. with me. Come on. You know, don't do it because once you get there, you're going to have a hard time getting out of it for the reasons I explained.
saying before in terms of that you're not going to say no or you're not going to realize it's happening. You're like slow on the uptake. Well, maybe I'll just do it because I might as well just do it and get it over with or I'm afraid he might hurt me. He seems a lot bigger. All of those questions could be placed aside if a question was asked. And I am comfortable with saying once that question is asked and a woman says yes, I'm comfortable with then calling some of that stuff consensual sex, Mm -hmm. right? Because then it's her responsibility. She said yes. Reason uh, is a uh, libertarian organization, and yes. what we, you know, one of the things that is is a bedrock kind of touchstone uh, in libertarianism is the idea of autonomy. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the things I find really appealing about your book is this discussion of consent mm-hmm. and of self ownership. Do your best to spin why, for a libertarian, specifically libertarian mm-hmm. audience, why consent is the central issue of of kind of the millennial generation. Right, sure. So, you know, if I want your wallet, I have to say, hey, can I have your wallet, right? And then you give it to me. I can't take it. I can't take really anything in this world without asking for permission first. But in sex, for some reason, everything's cool. Everybody, our our legal philosophy is everybody in America is agreeing to have sex with everybody else until somebody says no, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, does that really make a lot of sense? You know, certainly there should be sexual autonomy and bodily autonomy for young girls whose bodies really are pretty manhandled in this world and who deal with a lot of guys who want to touch them, right? They have something valuable. So they're demanding that they get a question first and then give consent. I think that's super simple, you know? All right, well, Mm -hmm. we will leave it there. Thank you. We've been talking with Vanessa Gregoriadis. She is the author of the new book, Blurred Lines, Rethinking Sex Power and Consent on Campus. Vanessa, thanks so much. Thank you so much. For Reason, I'm Nick Gillespie.